subscribe to Factly and hit the bell icon for updates. भैया मेरा वोटर आईडी करा। प्लांट रजिस्ट्रेशन करवा दो। मेरा स्कॉलरशिप। फाइल माय आईडी आ। दूसरा फॉर्म लेके आ। रूल पता है क्या? रजिस्ट्रेशन कहाँ है? बाद में आओ टाइम लगेगा। लंच के बाद। Is there a simple way to understand government rules? Hello everyone, welcome back to Decode. Today's episode is about the moral code of conduct. The document that says to political parties, agar ek dusre ko gali dena hai to do, lekin ek do kam do. <laughs> Jokes apart, the moral code of conduct or the MCC is a set of guidelines for political parties and candidates during the elections. It defines the do's and don'ts for the various groups that are involved. The main purpose of this is to provide a level playing field for all the contesting candidates and to bring decency and fairness to the chaotic election period. Now a surprising thing here is that the idea of the MCC actually came from the political parties. I know it is shocking but hey we should give credit where it's due. Started in the 1960s by political parties from Kerala, the MCC covers important aspects of electioneering like meetings and processions speeches and slogans, posters and placards. But again, it's not only during the old days that political parties came together to achieve a common end. It happens even today. Like uh, uh, the BJP and Congress coming together to amend the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Anyway, after the 1960s, the MCC has been gradually adopted by other political parties and it finally became a part of the Election Commission of India or the ECI's executive powers. Again, the 1991 elections were a huge turning point for the implementation of the MCC where the ECI had taken proactive steps to ensure that the MCC is observed. From then on, it has become an essential part of the election process. The MCC comes into effect as soon as election dates are declared by the ECI and remains in place until election results are declared. The MCC guidelines can be categorized into four broad groups, general conduct, meetings and processions, polling day and polling booths and finally guidelines for parties in power. Before I go through some of these guidelines, my humble request is that please don't laugh when I go through these. <clears throat> Here we go. We begin with general conduct. The first one, criticism should be confined to policies, past record and work only. Comments should not be made about candidates' private lives, unverified allegations and distortions such as calling someone Papu or Saudagar or Madame Italiano. Second, parties and candidates shall not create any hatred between communities. Third, no appeal for caste or communal feelings for votes, which often becomes the elephant in the room. Fourth, places of worship should not be used for propagating agenda. And fifth, avoid unlawful activities such as bribing, intimidating and impersonating voters. I'm very sure political parties and candidates after reading these will be going so I can't shout, I can't abuse or bribe. So election kai ko rakhe? Funny as it may sound, the unfortunate truth is that politicians resort to hate speech without any fear of consequence. Because most of the times these cases will be left pending in the court. And forget punishment, statistics show that hate speech boosts a candidate's or party's chance of succeeding in the elections. And as far as voter bribing is concerned, it's an open secret. Most of the times these cases go unreported and even when reported action rarely gets taken like the case of uh, RK Nagar and Tanjaur in Tamil Nadu where there was rampant voter bribing and the elections had to be postponed. But otherwise if no one complains no one cares. Then comes the guidelines for meeting and processions. First point police have to be informed in advance about the meeting to manage traffic and keep peace. Second point Parties have to take all the permissions needed like the use of loudspeakers and procession routes and whatnot. Third, organize processions in smaller groups. Now small is left to interpretation. Fourth, processions should be kept to the right of the road so as to allow traffic to go through. Seriously, keeping the procession to the right so the traffic can go through. <clears throat> Look at this party rally. Okay, 
Imagine an ambulance now. In fact, forget an ambulance. Tell me, how will this humble student make it in time for his first day of college? <laughs> Moving on, the next set of guidelines relates to polling day and polling booths. First, no campaigning for 48 hours before the close of poll. Second, there should only be simple candidate camps without any propaganda material such as posters, symbols and flags outside the polling booths. Third, only authorized agents with a valid pass from the ECI should enter the polling booth. And fourth, no sale of liquor during the 48 hours before close of poll. I feel your pain. We have all been through that. But thanks for taking one for the team. Then come the guidelines for parties in power. First, they are not supposed to use their official position for election campaigning. Second, they cannot mix official work with electioneering. So, if you are in office for 10 hours and spend 7 hours campaigning, it can't be considered as 17 hours of official work. Third, government transport should not be used for campaigning. Fourth, they should not monopolize grounds, helipads and government rest houses. Fifth, no new schemes or financial grants are allowed. Sixth, no ad hoc appointments of government officials. And most importantly, the seventh point, the public exchequer cannot be used for advertisements. And official mass media should not be used for partisan coverage and publicity of achievements. But again, our political parties and politicians are smart. They know how to circumvent the rules, don't they? The latest example is of uh, PM Narendra Modi's speech about the success of anti-satellite missiles that was broadcast on Doordarshan and the All India Radio. But that wasn't counted as a violation because it wasn't live on Doordarshan. Another one was when the BSP government in UP under Mayawati installed a number of elephant statues which is also the party symbol, by the way, using public funds. In this case, the ECI issued a ruling to cover all the statues as long as the MCC was in place. ECI, that's a good attempt, but a covered elephant still looks like an elephant. Within the MCC, there are three areas for which the ECI hasn't given concrete guidelines. The first of these is election manifestos. The ECI mentions that all the promises that are made in party manifestos can be considered political parties' plan for governance as long as they provide a feasible financial plan. But again, these are just guidelines. That is why there is somebody promising 15 lakhs, someone promising 72,000 rupees a month, no, 72,000 rupees per year or was it 72,000 crores, I don't know. But anyway, no one provides the whole plan as to how the financials will fit in. The second, the release of political movies. Currently, there are a couple of movies about to be released based on PM Narendra Modi and Rahul Gandhi. But again, no specific guidelines here. So if someone complains, the ECI is going to look into it case by case. But you still can't complain about bad acting, bad casting and bad direction. The third, social media. The ECI doesn't have any guidelines about it. The only thing that we have right now is voluntary code of ethics for the general elections 2019 submitted by the social media platforms. The platforms have committed to process any violations reported under section 126 of the Representation of People Act 1951 within three hours. But again, it is a voluntary code. So let's hope for the best. All being said, one important thing to know is that the MCC is not a statutory document. It just provides a set of guidelines for free and fair elections. So, violations of many of its provision doesn't attract any punishment. At most, people are let off with a warning, like in the cases of PM Narendra Modi and Rahul Gandhi, just to name a few. That said, some of the MCC provisions are enabled by the Indian Penal Code and the Representation of People Act. For example, um, creating hatred among different castes or religious groups, voter bribery, voter intimidation, voter impersonation, transporting voters and serving liquor on polling day are electoral offences that will be taken to court, where they will gather dust on the shelves for a long time. To be fair to the ECI, 
it has no control over these cases once they are sent to court. So to summarize, our MCC definitely deters political parties from going haywire, but it's not completely effective either. The main reason is that a lot of cases go unreported, and even if they are reported, the difficulty in collecting evidence is another hurdle. There is the problem of false complaints too, and of course, the finite resources of the ECI. To counter this, the ECI is seeking two things. Improve the laws and give the ECI better control of imposing the MCC. But again, improving the laws is in the hands of the parliament, which essentially means the political parties themselves. Reminds me of an old saying, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. So the ECI decided to take help of common people like you and me by introducing an app called C-Vigil to report violations of election rules. C-Vigil is a mobile application for citizens to report MCC and expenditure violations during elections. Currently, it's available only on Android phones. Sorry guys, there's no C-Vigil in the Apple Orchard. The app is very easy to use. Just take a picture or video and upload it with your report of a violation. One thing to note here is that you only have 5 minutes after you record the picture or video to upload it on the app. That means you cannot upload any old videos or pictures here. Also, really helpful feature about this app is that it auto captures the location, thus helping the flying squad to go to the reported location. Anyway, once the report is filed, the district control center, the flying squads and the surveillance teams will investigate the case and update the status in 100 minutes. One more important thing is that there is no need to reveal your identity while reporting a violation. You can always do it anonymously, which means you can remain a Gangadhar while actually being a Shaktiman. Hashtag 90s kids. So what are you waiting for? Pick up the phone and report anybody who violates the MCC and become election ke sache chaukidar. Hashtag civil bajao. Hashtag keep them in line. With that, we reach the end of this episode. In our next episode, we will talk about candidates and affidavits, or should I say, the candidate declarations. Like and share this video and leave us a comment with your feedback.